All right, welcome back to the Clara CFO Group channel. Today we're going to have a follow-on interview to when we talked to Kelly Paxton, the certified fraud examiner and private investigator, talking specifically about embezzlement and pink collar crime. Uh, we didn't want to leave you with just, hey, pink collar crime happens watch out. <laughs> we wanted to actually give you some practical information of what you can do, what you can do to help protect yourself from pink color crime, and also what things might be indicators that something might be going on in your organization. And if you need to be paying attention, um, we all need to be paying attention, but how can we be paying attention and what are some steps we can take so that we can make sure we are aware that something like this could be happening in our organization. So this is gonna get pretty practical. We're gonna give you guys tips. We really just figure out exactly what, what things you can actually do and something you can start doing today to help raise your awareness and hopefully help prevent this type of crime happening in your business. So. We're gonna jump back in with Kelly. If you're not already subscribed to the channel, please go ahead and subscribe. We would love to have you here and give this video a thumbs up if it's helpful to you or if it's interesting and make sure you're leaving comments in the comment section below. We would love to hear um, if you're willing to share, if you've had anything like this happen in your organization or if you've heard about it, we love the anecdotes. Um, if you will have any questions about something that seems suspicious, go ahead and put it in the comments below and you know maybe we can get kelly to even answer some questions for us so all right thank you guys so much and here's kelly again all right well kelly we are going to continue our conversation that we started last time with um where we kind of opened up the idea of what is pink color crime um who should be aware of it and um kind of what we need to be sort of opening our eyes to that this is reality, this is real, and we want to live in reality. If we're small business owners, we don't want to live in dreamland because <laughs> um, dreamland is fun, but you know, your, your money might be going away in the meantime. Um, so what we want to talk about this time is really how as we, we as small business owners, how can we protect ourselves from having embezzlement happen in our organizations? How can we, um, you know, set either set things up so that we are you know, setting our organization up in a good way so to prevent this? Or how can we identify if we think maybe something might be going on in our in our businesses? So um, maybe you can just one one of the concepts you talk about in your book, again, um, here it is embezzlement. Um, one of the things you talk about in the book is something called pink flags. Could you maybe um, tell us what pink flags are? Yeah, so just like red flags, but I like to make them pink. Um, mm -hmm. Like I wear pink. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, this is one thing where I don't want people to zone out and think like, oh my gosh, I have to hire a high-priced accounting firm. I have to hire consultants. I have to buy an expensive software program. These are really easy things to implement. Um, and I like to kind of say surprise and delight. Um, as business owners, we like to surprise and delight our customers. As a business owner, surprise and delight your staff. By like one example, if they think you only look at checks over a certain amount, say five thousand dollars, pull a check that's a thousand. Mm -hmm. So they think, oh, they look at all the checks. Um, another, this is a sort of mandatory thing. You must send your bank statements either home or to the post office box you control. Mm. I can't tell you how many stories I read about where they're like, well, they had the bank statements and it showed, you know, the numbers that I thought were there. Well, with Adobe Acrobat or any other software, I can make $500 look like 500,000 and 26 cents. Mm. So you have to get to the bank statement first. And whether that's home or a PO box that only you can control, mm -hmm. it needs to be. And again, that's just, it's a freebie. It is absolutely a freebie. Another pink flag is, do you have that employee that seems really, really dedicated and never misses work? They aren't missing work because they can't miss work because a client's going to call and say, my statement's wrong. Or you know, a bank statement's going to, it shouldn't come into the office, but it's going to come into the office and they're going to be able to hide it. Mm. Um, and none of these little micro like the younger generation takes like junkets, like two or three days. 
it's two weeks, a week to two weeks, because if you're gone two days, you're not, no one's going to look at your work, but if mm -hmm. you're gone two weeks, someone has to look at your work. Mm -hmm. Again, this is, I say no amount of artificial intelligence in the world can stop fraud mm -hmm. because fraud is committed by humans and AI doesn't have everything human. Mm. So really easy things that one of my other favorite ones is look out the window. I call it the parking lot audit. Yeah. Just look out the window. What kind of what kind of car is your employee driving? Mm -hmm. Is it a Range Rover and they make thirty grand a year? Is it the new model? What is X or Y Tesla? They make forty grand a year. Like what kind of car? And that goes to lifestyle. Do they go to Disney for two weeks a year? Do they you know fly private? Um, it's lifestyle. Does it match the salary? Mm -hmm. And it, that's not invasive. It's paying attention. Mm -hmm. That That's an interesting one because that's one I think where people go, well, I don't want to assume because, you know, maybe their, you know, maybe their spouse is doing really, really well, or maybe, um, you know, maybe they got an inheritance or something like that. And that's sometimes what those like stories will be. Um, that was one of the things with that, that movie, the, all the Queens horses movie was, um, she lived this extremely extravagant lifestyle. She had horses. She was like traveling all around. She had this big property and land. And there was lots of talk in the town of like, Oh, well, we think she's like an heiress or, you know, she, somebody died and left her a bunch of money and nobody knew the real story, but there was just lots of like gossip of what that was, but it was a very clear indicator that like this person had a lot of money somehow. <laughs> um, and she was actually, I think there were extra accounts that she controlled in the city that were never, um, that never really were visible to anybody else. So one day somebody called the bank and said, send me all the bank statements. Yeah. And when they sent it, it was like, nine accounts then it was and then they, seven and they thought they only had six exactly okay yes so yeah. there was like a missing account that only she had it was like her slush fund completely yeah. her slush fund so that's that's kind of a really good indicator um so not taking the if you have an employee who never ever wants to miss a day of work um you know even if they got in an accident and you're telling them to stay home they're trying to come in to you know do their work like it might look like dedication, but really they might be trying to cover their tracks on something. Um, and then, you know, if their their salary doesn't match what their perceived lifestyle is. Now, you don't ever want to accuse. This is where you get into that kind of trust but verify concept, right? You want to, um, you know, do your due diligence as a business owner, but you also want to stay aware of and keep your eyes open for potentially any indicators that <laughs> that might be pointing in another direction. Yeah. And you know, it's funny, like people will talk about sex more than they'll talk about money. If there was a woman <laughs> who stole $10 million um, from a car deal, family car dealership. And um, people did ask her like sort of, and she would go, she took crazy trips, like went to see the Pope and um, you know, took her family to the Super Bowl and had a box and there, they would ask her like, wow, that's, that's, and she's like, well, I'm blessed. And then she also said, I have a side travel hustle. So that's where I got those nice vacations. But, you know, it's still, it didn't make sense. But are you going to say, did you buy Microsoft stock in 1992? Like, it's a hard question to ask. It's right. very invasive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's where you would probably like use that as an indicator and, but not necessarily make it the, um, it, it wouldn't be the reason like you would, couldn't point to it and say, that's the reason, but it could make you go, Hmm, something's not adding up. Maybe I should do some digging and I should do some due diligence. I should go and maybe start to do some of these processes of looking into the numbers a little bit more than I have yeah. before. Um, so yeah, I like that a lot. Um, so indicators, what else? Like I, one of the things that we talked about the last time was about pressure. So if, um, if we've got the fraud triangle, so we've got pressure, rationalization, and opportunity, all three things of all, pretty much any time there's a fraud or an embezzlement, you've got all three things in play here. Somebody has the access to the money, however that looks like, whether it's check stocks or it, it's like check stock or 
it's, you know, ACH transfers, or it's, you know, changing the actual records and the bookkeeping or changing the, you know, the bank statements, whatever that looks like. We've got rationalization. That's where it's happening up here of it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Because of X, Y, and Z, I'm not getting paid enough. I need it. Whatever reason I, I deserve it. So I'm going to take it. Um, and then the pressure that's usually outside stimulus that's causing some sort of need, whether that's pressure to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah. I need the next luxury bag. I need a better car. I need whatever. I want to take a nice vacation. That could be the pressure or the, the pressure piece could really look like um, outside forces, like a gambling addiction or needing money because maybe you had like prior debts, like maybe high credit card debt or something like that. Somebody's knocking on your door, needing money that could cause an employee to go, well, I have access to $500,000 in this checking account. Maybe I'll just figure out how to get some of it over on my side. So I, I, I did a case up in kind of your area, a little bit South and um, the controller was literally getting um, casino, you know, high roller postcards at the office. Now I'm going to tell you, if you get any casino postcards for anyone in your office, that is a flag that you cannot like dismiss. They say 25% of all embezzlement, one study says 25% of all embezzlement cases have gambling at their core. Mm. And wow. so, um, when I interviewed some of the employees after the $750,000 embezzlement, they're like, yeah, you know, we knew we stopped at the casino on the way home and there were two on the way home. And he would get these kind of like cards, like inviting them to special events at the office. And I'm like, oh my God, like, yeah, crazy. Just, yeah. Crazy. <laughs> and, and, you know, gambling is like a whole, a whole thing that doesn't get talked about a lot, a gambling addiction or, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be the individual themselves. It could be a family member that has a struggle either with a drug addiction or um, gambling addiction. Those can be a real, um, you know, that pressure of yeah. like, I need to get some money because I need to figure out how to pay my, even it could be even be a spouse. Like I need to pay my spouse's debts. Yeah. And then you start getting tied into, it's not just the individual. It's, you know, they're, they're typically part of families. These are people who are, you know, family people. Like we talk about, we're hiring good people, you know, good people that don't have a criminal record. They typically have families and, you know, the, these things happen. So you just brought something out. Good people that don't have a criminal record. According to the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, only 4% of the fraudsters in their survey have a criminal record. Now, um, I've had cases where I know they stole before somewhere mm -hmm. else. And I can tell depending on how quickly they start stealing at the new place. If they start stealing within six months, maybe a year, you look at the old place, they probably stole there too. It, I mean, I had a girl who stole, um, you know, within a month of starting a new job. Wow. So, so they don't have criminal histories or like, this is just a really sad story. A good friend of mine, um, she has a former coworker good, good friend, um, who just got caught stealing over 20 grand. And she's like, she said to her after the fact, she goes, well, I don't have to say I have a felony because it got pled down to a misdemeanor. A lot of these cases get pled down to misdemeanors, depending on the, if they have a good attorney, the amount of money that was stolen. So just because they don't have a felony doesn't mean, you know, so a background check, Another thing you said that like, I was like, oh, okay. We don't hire people we don't like, or we don't think we will like, like, mm. we're not going to let that scary dude come into our office. We're just mm -hmm. not going to do it. Mm -hmm. So we hire people that we like, or we think we will like. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's part of it. Like Ted Bundy and Bernie Madoff, like people yeah. like them until. Mm -hmm. they yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, likability is a factor. I think one of the stories from your book that was really interesting to me was, um, you know, one of the business owners was said, you know, I trusted this person so much. It was almost like they had almost the business owner themselves. The trust was so broken that it was like they were broken because 
they it it caused them to sort of like mentally go, oh my goodness, who else in my life have I not trust? You know, who else in my life is doing this to me that I haven't? I mean, it it starts to get almost into that feeling of a partner cheating on you or whatever it, it might be. It's like I put so much trust in this person, and here they were doing this the whole time, you know. Well, and second that, guess yourself. Mm -hmm. the, the attorney business owner I talked to yesterday, he was second. He goes, I'm second guessing everything. I do. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, you know what, just you're a good lawyer, get back to lawyering. And mm -hmm. you know, you, you, I tell everyone who's been a victim, you need to get back to doing what you do best. I don't want a brain surgeon cutting into my head who is distracted, right? Get back to doing what you do best. Because unfortunately, you're going to have to hire an attorney, you're going to have to hire someone like me, and we're not free. Mm -hmm. And so and how do you make money in your business? Mm -hmm. So get back to what you do best. Yeah. I think that that's, that's a good lesson too. It's just like, you know, these things do happen and it goes back to not victim shaming. Like these things are going to happen. And then what we, what do we need to do if they do, we like stand up and we take care of it. And, um, you know, we continue to work in our businesses and it doesn't mean because one person did this to you that it's forever, that everybody is going to do that to you. Um, but you can, start putting into place maybe things to help so that hopefully you prevent it from happening again. Um, and maybe we can kind of get into some, some really practical, maybe internal controls, because this is the, the corporate word for this or corporate terminology is internal controls. And those are like processes, procedures, um, practices that we do that can help uh, make sure that the money or the goods are being used appropriately because, you know, embezzlement can happen both in money and it can also happen in, you know, physical goods, things falling off the back of the truck, <laughs> so to speak. Um, that happens a lot in um, dental offices and uh, medical offices where maybe drugs are being kind of like siphoned off to the side or goods or whatever it is. So um, that, that can happen. So maybe we can talk we in the last time we discussed tone at the top and that actually is an internal control because if you are exemplifying quality and um like conscientiousness about the money that it will bleed down into your employees if you are um I, i'd say the other one that i see from from my perspective is that the business owner cares about the financials and reviews them and and lets people know that they are reviewing them and whether or not they do it actually every month is maybe a different thing. But as much as like the employees know, this is a process I have to, I, I have to know that they, that everything's being looked at by the business owner, that can be kind of an overarching control for a business. What are some other ideas that business owners could do that are just real simple? Well, the, you know, like the surprise and delight. Mm -hmm. If, if they think that you only look at, um, there was a woman who stole from a municipality. She knew the auditors came every June. She'd steal up until May 31st, take a month off, and then start stealing again July 1st. She did that for years. So if you do have auditors or outside, you know, uh, accountants reviewing it, mix it up. Mm -hmm. Again, mix it up. Um, you know, a simple thing is I just was listening to a podcast, a very, very successful speaker, you know, management consultant. He says he has a call every Friday with his accounting person. And that person tells him how much is in each account. And he believes it. Mm. He's never, he, he, like he inferred, he goes, yeah, the guy tells me exactly how much, you know, money I have. And then I know what I can do, but he doesn't verify it. Trust, but verify. I had a woman who stole $250,000 from a medical clinic. Every Friday, the CPA would come to the office and meet with the chief urologist and they would download the, you know, their accounting program. And not one Friday did they pull a check. So oh. this woman, Lisa, would sit in, the, in her office and see the accountant and the chief surgeon um, in there. And she's like, they never pulled a check. Like if they mm -hmm. would have pulled a check, she goes, I just wrote checks out to me. But she built them differently. And she's sitting there. I was like, how are you not sweating buckets? Like, mm -hmm. like because once I knew that they never pulled a check, I knew they never pulled a check. Pull a check. Yeah. 
pull a check. Like in that meeting, that financial review meeting with that, that other, the speaker was doing, he could surprise and delight and be like, oh, great, great. I'm going to log into the bank and just like, can you show yeah. me where to find that on the statement and log on to the bank, find from the bank, the actual PDF, not even asking for the PDF from the individual, but say, oh, great. Like I just, you know, I'm going to log into the bank right now. And just, you know, as we're, as we're talking, just so I know that I'm looking at the right thing, you know, you can even I play a little bit ignorant here. Oh, can you show me where I can find that number? You know, yeah, <laughs> something like that a call and you can share your screen. Yes. Yeah. Or yeah. I have the business owner log into the, the thing and be like, okay, great. Let's like, just look at it right now. That's that trust, but verify. I want to say that like what you're telling me is correct. Let me find it so that I can make sure that I'm looking at the right thing. You know, um, I, I think that that's a really, really good tip of just like mixing it up. Um, maybe even somebody comes back from Costco and, you know, going back to the Costco example and saying, you know, oh, can you grab your receipt for me? Maybe you've never, maybe they've never had to do that before. And, yeah. um, you know, hey, we're going to actually, maybe the CEO is like, actually, if you're a small business, I'm going to put a basket in my office. And anytime that gets purchased, anything that gets purchased, like we're going to start putting the receipts right here in the basket in my office. So first of all, that CEO starts to have like direct contact when anybody is going to um, Costco, but then you've kind of surprised maybe a, you know, a new, a new thing that you kind of are now saying, Hey, I'm actually paying attention to this, which is sending that indicator of, I care. Even if you've spent $20 on jeans, you don't need, um, or that the business doesn't need. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I think those are the types of things that very, very simple. This is not rocket science to what you, you said, like, this is not rocket science, but it is extremely important to tie employees um, mindset with, I cannot get away with whatever I want here. The business owner, I say, put guardrails in place. Like mm -hmm. people want to be honest. I mean, mm -hmm. I say this every day. I can't get out of bed if I don't, if I think people are going to steal from me, but mm -hmm. let's make it a little bit harder for them to steal from me. Don't leave the $5 sitting on the the thing, but they might mm -hmm. walk past that $5 in order to pick up $500 in a check. Exactly, so just yeah. because, I mean, I had this great case where um, it was a hospitality industry and I went into the CEOs and he has like a fake watch and he's like, oh yeah, every so often we'll put it in to make sure the maids aren't stealing it. Well, meanwhile, you know, $750,000 had walked out the door. So they were doing these little things like the $5, put the $5 mm -hmm. out, but you know what? That person will pass it up to go write that check for a thousand bucks. Just, yeah. Yeah. I, I love this sort of surprise and delight. It just means you're staying, you're staying engaged. Mm, yeah. You're saying, yeah, I think that's, and that is one of the biggest, I think, challenges. I don't want to say failings, challenges for small business owners is because they feel like they have to be engaged in everything. So it's hard to disconnect from some things because they need to focus their attention on growing the business or X, Y, or Z. But like, you cannot totally outsource or totally, you know, never look at the finances, even if it's not something you like to do. Um, I mean, that's one reason why sometimes people hire me is because I'm, I'm a CFO. So it's like, hey, I mean, I don't have access. I don't have access to do like anything. So I don't have access to write a check. I don't have access to do any of these things. So I can't do anything to steal money from them but I'm in this position of oversight where I can be looking at the detail, asking the questions, bringing things up to them, which becomes like, maybe they need to outsource that to a certain extent, or maybe they don't know the questions to ask, but at least it's another level of oversight. Now, will we find everything if there's something going on? Probably not, but at least like it also sends a message. I've hired a CFO. Yeah. It sends a message to the bookkeeper. It sends a message to the tax person. It sends a message to the other employees like, ooh, somebody else is going to be looking at the numbers now, you know? <laughs> so well, I, don't, I don't know if you do this because of COVID and everything, but like there's a whole phenomenon um, when there's distance between you and a person, like physical distance, 
-hmm. they are more likely to be less honest. So Mm -hmm. that sort of, you know, drive by, I call it in the office where you go and I'm looking at you Mm -hmm. and they see that face. It doesn't hurt. Now I know with COVID it's a little bit different, but like we will get back to quote normal. And Mm -hmm. when they see you and they see that you're looking at stuff, I think it makes them kind of like, Hmm, she looks pretty smart. Like, can I pull this over? Mm. So I, and there's, there's lots of work in behavioral science about that. You know, casinos, we don't, I don't gamble at all ever, but um, (laughs) they use chips for a reason. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's, so that distance between the chip and then going and cashing it in Mm -hmm. different stuff goes on there. So I think the drive-by in the office where you go in and you meet the, um, you know, the assistant, the AR, the AP. I have a colleague who did a case um, and the guy, you know, thought he was getting ripped off and he's explaining who does what. And he gets to his administrative assistant and he's like, oh, don't look at her. She's too dumb to steal from me. Now that's tone at the top. Guess who stole? Her. Her. Especially if she heard that. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't know. But I mean, the fact that he would say that, yeah. like, that also gives to the rationalization. Exactly. It's like, that guy doesn't think I can, he thinks I'm a ding dong. Well, I'll show him how ding dong he is. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think there's the, that tone on the top will um, definitely play out in your employees. And they, they understand because I hear it when I'm talking to other, you know, other employees in the organization, if we're talking about more operational things, you know, that stuff comes out in conversations, Um, you know, Oh, he never looks at that. So like, we, we don't really, we're we're supposed to write that on the invoice, but we don't because he never looks at it. So, I mean, why would we do that step if he's never looking at it? You know, those are the types of things that, um, you know, they just, it trickles down and employees know what they can get away with. In, in certain ways. And it's not necessarily that they're trying to be fraudulent, but they know what matters and what doesn't matter based on, you know, what their boss is looking at, what their boss is not looking at. So. I have a great example. I did this for um, a very successful group of people. They were all male business owners, but um, I gave this example for tone at the top. So say that um, their biggest customer has to sign the contract for the next year by Friday. It's the end of the month. And the customer calls up on Wednesday and says, hey, we're not going to sign that until next week. And the business owner knows that if they don't have that contract signed, they're going to be out of loan covenants. And so the business owner, this is what goes through their mind is I'm going to call down to John or Sally and I'm going to tell them to date it and have, you know, put it in the system. Because if I don't do that, we're going to be out of loan covenants and I may have to lay off John or Sally and they may have a diabetic kid and blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And you know what? I know they promised me that they would sign it, but John or Sally know that now that person is compromised. And so that's, and and when I gave that example, you could see the audience where they're just like, and (laughs) it happened the the, the, you know, the customer was like, I'll just sign it next week. It's not a problem. The rationalization for the tone at the top, the guy's going, if I don't do this, the bank's going to pull my line of credit and I'm going to have to lay people off. This is just, it's just a technicality. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. Well, and that's where you get, that's where you start to get like those larger, I mean, that's where you start to get into some major white collar, you know, issues yeah. of um, fraudulent financial reporting. We just need, it's, it's just a day. It's just one day that, you know, we didn't get that. So, I mean, that, that happens all across this whole, um, this whole sphere of, you know, when people are making decisions to do these, there's a lot of times it's very, very conscious decision. That's the difference between also like an error. We have errors all the time. There's a difference between error and intentional fraud. Um, You know, somebody might have accidentally used their, you know, um, put their business credit card on, you know, their Uber Eats account. I did that. I mean, I totally did that. And then we fixed it. It was an error and we repaid the company, you know, it was like that, that does happen. And it's, that's, that's the difference between intentionality versus something that just happens because, you know, but you find out a lot of these times they happen, they start with an error 
And then somebody says, oh, I can always charge my Uber Eats off to the company because nobody ever said anything. So I'm just going to keep on getting my getting my meals <laughs> yeah, that, or whatever this the next is thing, thing is. that kind of goes to tone at the top, the being, the being able for the employee to come and say, I screwed up. And mm -hmm. actually Dan Ariely did a bunch of work on this. And it's like a company that is successful financially is a company that allows their employees to say, I messed up. Yes. Absolutely. And if, if there's, this is where I'm conflicted on the zero tolerance. If there is a zero tolerance, they're going to be too scared to say, and they're going to hope it just slides through. Whereas mm -hmm. if you have that relationship where it's like, you know what, I accidentally put those jeans in my Costco or in the Costco cart. Here's the check right now. Mm -hmm. If they don't feel that they can do that, if they feel they will be punished for it, they won't come forward. And you know what, that's where, so allow your employees to be able to say, I messed up. Yeah. And that can be accomplished both in just actual, um, that can be, you know, maybe actually written out in, let's say an HR policy or your employee handbook or something like that. Like, here's what you do if like, you feel like you've made a mistake that, I mean, that could be policy. You can have that, but then that's also, also example by leadership of like, hey, this happened. Um, but it's also, it happens in conversation um, that where leaders can you know be open to employees owning up to actually what's happened and, you know, finding solutions. That that happened, let's find a solution. Okay, yeah. like we're kind of done. Um, but yeah, absolutely, tone at the top for sure. So, okay, well, I don't wanna keep you any longer because I feel like we could talk about this for a long time. <laughs> Uh, super interesting to me, and I'm sure everybody will be really interested as well. Now, I, I again, guys, if this is if the to if this topic is interesting to you, find Kelly's book on Amazon. We'll put a description to it in um, in the or we'll put a link in the description box below because the stories in here are real and they're incredible. I mean, I think knowing what can happen can be just so eye-opening. And thank you for sharing um, your stories and your in incredible career because what, what an interesting path you've taken. <laughs> um, but I think all of this is just super helpful for small business owners. So I really appreciate you taking the time today. Thank you so much, Hannah. Awesome. Well, Kelly was super informative, really super helpful. I mean, I feel like fraud is one of those things that nobody talks about, but everybody needs to know about. And really we need to think about just keeping our eyes open, you know, that as small businesses, we want to have that. We do want to be able to establish trust with people, but we always have this concept of trust, but verify trust, but verify. You can totally have trust in your individual employees. I think it's absolutely a good thing. And they like to feel that they are trusted. Um, but also as a business owner, we need to verify. We need to make sure that we are understanding what's happening in our business and we're not letting things just fly under the radar, especially for years and years and years and years. All right. So if you haven't um, seen it yet, please pick up a copy of Kelly Paxton's book. Guys, I read this in um, just a, a plane ride and it was honestly pretty engaging. Um, she has a great personality and it comes through in the book and lots of stories. So um, the stories are really gold here and she gives lots of different concepts that you can keep in mind. And she even gives like practical tips at the end of a lot of the chapters. She'll say, here's something you can do to, I mean, pink color prevention tips. I mean, it's right there. So um, really, super helpful information, you guys. So check out her book. The link to the book will be in the description box below. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day.